Why do physicians and other high achievers have a higher rate of anxiety than the rest of the population? And what are some coping mechanisms? Find out. Hey, this is Brad Block, host of the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. This is a personal and professional development podcast for physicians where we have experts on the show that try to teach us everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. Dr. Demetrio Satiris, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast. Dr. Bradley Block, thanks for having me. <laughs> So he's been on the show before, but for those who, who hadn't heard the episode, Dr. Tsitsiris is, is a practicing board certified psychiatrist specializing in the field of anxiety management. He's a clinical assistant professor of psychiatry at Northeast Ohio Medical University. He studies and writes about the interface of anxiety and achievement, which is perfect for our audience because being physicians, we are high achievers and therefore many of us are actually more likely than the rest of the population to suffer from anxiety. And his popular psychology Sorry, his popular Psychology Today blog, Anxiety in High Achievers, has been read by more than half a million readers. He's also given a TEDx talk on the subject titled, Why Success Won't Make You Happy. So, Dr. Tetsiris, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast. Dr. Block, I'm so happy to be here. The, uh, it's truly an honor to be on your podcast again. Thank you so much. So, let's start with the basics. What is anxiety? Yes, anxiety is that feeling of dread that we get in anticipation of a future event, right? It's the feeling that we get uh, before taking our board exams, before seeing a challenging patient, before a job interview. And it's that feeling of alarm that we feel it throughout our body, maybe in our gut, right? And what I like to tell people is that to have anxiety is to be human from an evolutionary standpoint. Uh, the job of our brain is is not to make us happy. It's to protect us uh, from what can go wrong, right? Imagine what the world was like uh, thousands of years ago. We had to worry about falling victim to a lion hiding behind a bush or a gator lurking under the waters. Of course, evolution happens at a snail's pace, but the environment changes rapidly. And now we have different things to worry about, such as what people think about us and our job performance. So anxiety is a universal human experience. So is that the only manifestation, that like pit in our stomach? Oh, no. There's physical symptoms from head to toe. You name it, I've heard it, right? So people can get like tension headaches. They can have neck tension, chest tightness, shortness of breath. From head to toe, people can experience symptoms when it comes to anxiety. But it sounds like it's adaptive, right? And yet because in our current society – we are more comfortable, right? So we're still having these threats. They're not to our existence, though. They're not threats of death, but our physiologic response is the same response as it would be to like that imminent gator attack. Yeah, even though I would argue that as a psychiatrist, I am often exposed to people's existential threats. They tell them to me all the time in therapy sessions. But yes, so we have this archaic brain in us, right, which has an amygdala. And the amygdala doesn't know whether a lion is running at you or you're stuck in traffic or you have a job interview. It just knows that there is a threat and it just activates the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the HPA axis, which leads to the production of cortisol. So we have an archaic brain that just does its job, which is to protect us. But the environment has changed, and now we have different things to stress about. That aren't genuine threats. I mean, they're threats to our maybe our well-being, but not imminent danger. Yes, they're not as imminent as they used to yeah. be, as what our ancestors had to deal with. But they're still valid, and they're still legitimate stressors that we have to cope with on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so we shouldn't be denigrating are the things that are causing us anxiety. We shouldn't be minimizing. Oh, no. Quite the opposite. You know, the, the one thing that I try to do with everyone that I see is the number one thing is validate their anxiety. Because if you deny someone's anxiety, if you deny that alarm that we have, it actually amplifies. It gets worse because the brain will continue to gnaw at you if you don't address the stressor. So the number one thing you want to do with anxiety is to acknowledge it, to, to validate it. The second thing that you want to do is actually not eliminate it because some anxiety is healthy, right? It's okay to have anxiety before a job interview or before you know meeting with your boss because anxiety is motivational. It gives you some energy 
to prepare in advance. What we want to do is reduce the anxiety to a healthier uh, level. So we don't want to eliminate anxiety. It's a vital part of our existence. We just want to make sure that it's not excessive, that it's not interfering with your daily functioning, right? So that's the key distinction. So are you speaking as the psychiatrist talking to the patient or are you also referring to self-talk? Because I feel like some of the ways that I manage my anxiety, maybe it's not correct, is by saying, I'm being ridiculous about this. This is something that I can't control. And so perseverating on it is doing me no good. So I'm trying to minimize it or rationalize it. Is that, you know, is... So I understand what you're saying in terms of like, as someone psychiatrist, you do not want to minimize what they're feeling. But what about inside our own heads? Oh, I, we're, I'm speaking to, to everyone, okay. you know, and um, even though someone does not have an anxiety disorder, it does, and even though they're high functioning, it doesn't mean that the anxiety is not subtly interfering with their day-to-day -day functioning. So examples for physicians may be, you know what, you're at work. And you're doing a, you know, you've had a busy day at work and you take care of your patients, but it was really high stress. Then you come home and you're short with your spouse and you're short with your kids and you're not present with them and you're more irritable and more on edge. And then it's harder for you to fall asleep. So on paper, you're high functioning. You're a physician, right? But you're bringing home a healthy salary. You're taking care of patients, but there are cracks in your foundation. So you can have high functioning anxiety in which on paper, professionally, you're doing well, but behind the facade, behind that facade of a physician that we have, you're actually experiencing some difficulties that are very subtle, but they can negatively impact different aspects of your life, right? That's actually the main reason that I decided to go into therapy is because I wasn't being the dad that I thought I could be. I wasn't being the dad that I thought my kids deserved, even though I never really until recently thought of myself as someone with anxiety. Now that I've shown a light on it, like it's now become so, so apparent. Yeah, I agree. And I think once we acknowledge something and we work on addressing it, I think it has the potential of making us better physicians, better spouses, better parents, just better, more well-rounded human being. So the beauty of therapy, and thank you for sharing your personal experience, by the way, the beauty of therapy is that it leads to self-awareness. You know, a lot of times people tell me that they have, that they're um, experiencing different manifestations of anxiety without even knowing that they're anxious. Like they might tell me that they're irritable or not sleeping, or they might need an extra cocktail at night to go to bed, or they're like on edge and tense, and they have no clue they have anxiety. Or during a session, I might see somebody and their like shoulders are up to their ears. And I might point out to them like, hey, do you want to like lower those shoulders a little bit? Because, you know, you seem awfully tense right now. So many people, they have this churn of anxiety in the background without even being aware that they're anxious. Yeah, I actually see it somewhat frequently as an ENT in couple different manifestations. One is I see a lot of sleep apnea. And so people come in and they're like, I'm tired all the time and I can't get to sleep. And I wake up frequently. And what they're describing is not sleep apnea. They're describing insomnia. And it sounds like they have this excess sympathetic tone from anxiety. And, you know, I'll see tons of people with bruxism, right? They come in with ear pain from TMJ, from bruxism. So I have all sorts of, and, you know, it's in all different specialties. I, one of my first podcast episodes where we talked about the uh, with, with a gastroenterologist. She said the colon is the window to the soul because they see so much abdominal pain manifesting from anxiety. So, so what is it about physicians or even high achievers in general that make us more prone to anxiety than the rest of the population? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a number of variables. The first one is that medicine is not easy. People don't come to us because they're happy-go-lucky. People come to us because they're suffering. And as physicians, we're in the front line of trauma, right? We're exposed to trauma, be it medical trauma or psychological trauma, right? And anxiety is contagious. You know, when people come to us and they're suffering and they're helpless and they're powerless and doctor, help me get better, it's impossible not to feel that projection of anxiety onto us. 
Okay. So there's this projective identification that happens. Like we feel their anxiety. So even if medicine happened in like this utopia, this ideal world, it is a very anxiety provoking uh, profession. But then on top of that, medicine is filled with systemic variables that make it even more stressful, more anxiety provoking, right? There's bias in medicine. You know, there's, you know, a toxic culture that promotes stoicism at all costs and self-reliance, right? There's a loss of autonomy that we're dealing with. There's an increase in workloads. You know, physicians are graduating with a ton of student debt. So on top of that, there are systemic factors that make us vulnerable to anxiety. And then on top of that as physicians, the third uh, variable is that we have personality traits that make us vulnerable to anxiety. As an example, we're type A, right? There's a study that shows that I think 63% of doctors identified as being type A. The other were type A also. They just didn't know it, right? <laughs> it's because it's impossible. Like, it's because not- <laughs> they're comparing themselves to our peers who are just more type A than them. They're just like, oh, I'm not as type A as that person. Yeah, but you're still type A. Exactly, right? Or like we're perfectionists, right? And perfectionism is associated with a host of mental health conditions, including anxiety. We're self-reliant. We don't ask for help. And we're very achievement-oriented. So you add our traits on top of that, and you can see how we're very vulnerable to experiencing uh, difficulties with anxiety. So you had mentioned, the, the first thing was that the we deal with trauma, right? The, that our patients are often going through quite a bit and we can carry that with us. So as someone who treats anxiety all day long, how is it that you don't leave with some of their anxiety? Like, how do you protect yourself from that? Oh, I do experience their anxiety. I don't want to give people false pretenses. I am there, I am subject to difficulties with depression and anxiety. But I think the key is, number one, self-awareness. Realizing when my anxiety is a 5 out of 10 and implementing coping skills right away instead of, it, instead of waiting for it to become an 8 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10, right at its worst. So it's that self-awareness, noticing when I'm talking faster than usual, noticing when my shoulders are up to my ears, right? So that's the first thing, self-awareness. The second thing is being honest, right? And having and communicating with my support system. As an example, if I'm having a rough day, I'll check in with my spouse on on my drive home and be like, hey, today I'm depleted. I'm a two out of 10. How are you feeling? She might be an eight out of 10. She might have had a good day. I heard Brene Brown talking about that on an Instagram post. Is that that where you got it? (laughs) It's huge. No, but but I use it in my personal life. Absolutely. It really helps me. And then there's days that I had a good day at work and I'm an eight and she's a two. And that's when I have to carry the workload. So after self-awareness is communication with our loved ones. And there's days that we're both depleted. And at those days, the kids are just going to be watching YouTube and that's okay. That's okay. Yes. Because you don't want to give them both of, you don't want to be at your worst self and just taking away that TV time because you're supposed to, even though it's going to damage your relationship with them. Yeah. I I think I need to be more comfortable with that too. Well, I think what happens like when we're both depleted and stressed and then we're like a two out of 10 and we pretend like we're an eight and we deny that two out of 10, it just gets worse and worse. It's like a spiral that happens, yeah. right? And I'm irritable and they're irritable, but we're denying our irritability. And then like everyone's feeding off that negative energy. So I, I just look at it as limiting the damage. Like, let's be straight here. Like if, if I'm a two and my spouse is a two, let's not pretend that we're an eight out of 10. Let's acknowledge that we're a two out of 10, that we're depleted and high anxiety. And let's implement steps in order to limit the damage and live the fight another day. So are there any other coping mechanisms that that you recommend? I mean, for instance, like you have someone who's, who at least believes themselves to be doing well during the day and they're managing and they're fine. And then they lie down to go to bed and that's when their mind starts racing and then they can't go to sleep or if they do fall asleep because they're so exhausted, they can't stay asleep. They've got that excess sympathetic tone. So is there anything for that particular situation? Sure, absolutely. Let me take a step back before I answer that question. So I like to think of anxiety as a biopsychosocial phenomenon, meaning that there are biological, psychological and environmental 
factors that contribute to it. As a result, we need coping skills that address all three parts there, right? So for somebody who's struggling with sleep, for example, one thing that I would tell them, biologically speaking, is let's be a little more active during the day. Let's make sure that we're exercising and depleting ourselves a little bit, physically speaking, so that we're not all tense and wound up when we're trying to go to bed. Uh, Another thing is to engage in a scanning of the body and noticing where you're holding the tension. Because if you're going to try to go to bed like this, again, with your shoulders up to your ears, what are you telling your amygdala? It's time to fire because you've taken on a guarded position. So again, your amygdala doesn't know if a lion's running at you or you're stressed from work. It just fires in response to your body's posture. A psychological thing that I like to do, a cognitive exercise. Sorry, actually, just is, before you, those different oh, body sure. places, just so the audience can, when they're doing a body scan, there's like what I, I noticed recently that I keep it in my jaw, right? That's why I sleep with a night guard because yeah. all my patients have TMJ. Yeah. So I have it too. So I sleep with a night guard and I actually have to when I'm lying down to go to bed, consciously relax my jaw. And then I, it'll tense up and I got to do it again. So shoulders, jaw, what are some other common places where you notice people are keeping their tension? Their calves is a big one, really? right? They're all uptight. Yeah, absolutely. And then like they're having like uh, restless legs or their muscles cramp up in that area. Absolutely. Their breathing is much more rapid and shallow, right? So they hold it in their chest and their heart's racing. So then we have to engage in, you know, some deep breathing exercises. Um, lower back is another common area. Um, for Again, shoulders and neck is a very common area. So a lot of the skeletal muscles where you can actually start to notice, like, what part of the body hurts and then start to, like, stretch the part of the body out, right? Yeah. Is there, are you ever going to ask someone to give up coffee? Because I just feel like there's an ethical line that shouldn't be crossed there. Well, it's, I drink my coffee too. I don't want to come up as like a hypocrite, but you know, coffee has a half-life of six hours. Yeah. So when we have a cup of coffee at two o'clock in the afternoon, half of it's in our body eight o'clock at night, a quarter of it in our body, in our bloodstream about 2 a.m., right? So just being very mindful uh, when consuming uh, coffee. I mean, again, I have my one cup of coffee uh, in the morning and I typically sip it Throughout the day, like that one cup of coffee, like a nice little steady state. Yeah, yeah. Just methodical. to be mindful about how it can. Yeah, very methodical. <laughs> nice little steady state. You know, it's like a little uh, drip. Back to the sleep, though. I want to like answer that question too. As far as a psychological intervention, what I tell people is there's a difference between planning for the next day and worrying endlessly. Like planning is a lot more efficient, effective, productive, whereas worrying is just kind of like endless thoughts. You know stacked one on top of the other. So a a cognitive exercise is to grab a pen and paper around in the evening for five minutes and just ask yourself, what would make tomorrow a good day? And write those four to five things down. It might be showing up to work on time or going to your kid's soccer practice or, you know, helping with stuff around the house, whatever that looks like. And just write those things down. Like what would make tomorrow a good day? So that when the brain starts to like fire frantically, like in the middle of the night, you can tell your brain, hey, thank you. But we've had our meeting already at 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. We had our meeting and we're sticking with our plan. And guess what? Tomorrow night we'll have a meeting again. And you can tell me about your worry thought tomorrow, (laughs) brain. So that way you're having a meeting with your brain, with your amygdala, with your anxiety. And again, there's a difference between planning and worrying. And the first time you do it, it's weird. But once you've done it 50 times or 100 times, it becomes a habit and it becomes automatic and it's actually a lot more calming. Does that make sense? Because your brain kind of anticipates it. You look forward to that meeting. Yeah. So that's something that people can try to reduce anxiety at night. That's interesting. We had an episode a few months ago on mindfulness and that that came up. It was, you know, it's like a gratefulness practice. It was a little different, but it was like, you know, one or two things from the day that you're grateful about. What one or two things from the next day that you absolutely have to do, but adding this, you know, one or two things from the next day that you would really like to do and making sure that it's going to make its way into your day. I think that's, that works really well. That works really well. And I think all of that together 
will probably help to calm the brain. And then gratefulness. You know, it's hard to be, it's hard to be maybe not anxious, but depressed, I think, when you're grateful. It's hard to hold those two things in your head at the same time. Yeah, what I would say about gratitude, and I I practice that every morning, you know, I I take one thing that I'm grateful for, and I feel grateful for it for like two minutes every morning, like clockwork, because I'm the first one up in in my household. And, you know, I get ready. And before I leave for work, just one thing, it might be my son, my daughter, being healthy, whatever that is. And, you know, gratitude has a negative connotation, because people, they look at it as being synonymous with toxicity, you know, like positive toxicity like but what i look at gratitude i consider it as a healthy antidote to anxiety so you know when we're anxious we're like stressing and we're looking at the branches of a tree and we're worrying about what can go wrong in our lives and what gratitude does is make us take a step back and it helps us have a panoramic view of the forest like yeah all these things are happening in your life and my life that are really stressful and look at everything else that you have to be grateful for because it's easy to get lost in our worry thoughts and neglect the blessings that we do have in our life, every single one of us. So gratitude is an antidote and a healthy counterbalance to the anxiety provoking thoughts in our brain. What if you have a patient that then turns that around and they're like, things are too good to be true. Something's definitely going to be going wrong soon. This is life is too good right now. So are you referring to like, I'm trying to understand that question, like a flight to health where like all of a sudden they're like doing better? Or are you referring to them being very skeptical and cynical yes. of like, when's the other shoe going to exactly. fall? Exactly. The second one. They're yeah, like, the second like one. we have all of our student loans paid off. We live in a nice neighborhood. Our kids are healthy. We have stable incomes. Like life is good. They So they stop worrying. They stop being anxious about, you know, what could be in a more specific way. And then they turn their eye inward and they're like, very grateful for all this stuff. But then they're like, wait a second, wait a second. The other shoe is going to drop. This is now too good to be true. Yeah. Yeah. And the brain is a master storyteller, right? Like when you're coming up with anxiety, these worry thoughts, these are really hypothetical scenarios, the majority of which never come to life. So the brain is just doing its job there. It's just creating Worst case scenario thoughts is just trying to protect you by looking for what can go wrong. Hey, don't put your guard down. This is too good to be true, right? So in that kind of a scenario, you know, reminding people that, you know, these worry thoughts are okay, but I might go a little more CBT in that situation if it's more cognitive, like what is the worry thought? And what are the odds that this worry thought will come to reality? Like, what are the odds? Because if your worry thought has a 90% chance of coming to reality, that's a lot more stressful than it having a 1% chance, right? Yeah. Like, if I go to my doctor and I show him a skin lesion and he's like, yeah, you know, Demetrius, I, I think this is um, melanoma, th- that creates a different level of anxiety versus being told, well, odds are it's benign, less than 1%, but let's just biopsy it just for the heck of it, right? right? So what are the odds that this fear that I have will come to reality? Right. Yeah. Uh, another question to ask yourself is what can I do within reasonable steps, within reason, to reduce these odds? You know, like if you're worried about getting in a car accident and getting sued, well, maybe get car insurance, maybe have umbrella insurance on top of that, right? Yeah. You're really lowering the odds of something catastrophic happening financially speaking, right? So, in those say, situations where it's more cognitive, I might go the cognitive path with with folks. Now, you mentioned like the situation where there's something has a 90% chance of happening. So I'll give you an example. Like physicians, like an emergency room doctor at the height of COVID who was afraid to go to work. That doesn't sound like anxiety to me. That sounds like worry, right? Like that's not (laughs) because it's a genuine threat. It's really out there. Like, how do you counsel someone in that situation? Or can you not? Because you're like, yes, that sounds, it's like a genuine threat and you need to do whatever you can to mitigate that risk. Yeah. Well, anxiety is both cognitive and physical, right? So anxiety is associated with worry thoughts. And then these worry thoughts generate physical symptoms from head to toe. So it's a combination of both that 
and they tend to fuel each other. Like, you know, we have these worry thoughts that fuel physical symptoms, and then these physical symptoms make us more vulnerable to worry thoughts. So it's like the cycle of anxiety that we're talking about. Yeah. So let's take that example, right? Like 2020 or 2021, we're dealing with uh, the pandemic at that point. Number one, you, you validate someone's anxiety. The anxiety is is valid, and your, your, your brain is just trying to protect you from what can go wrong. Number two, what is the specific worry about the pandemic? Is it you getting sick? Is it getting loved ones sick? Like, let's kind of peel the onion and really understand in depth, what are you anxious about? Yeah. Number three, what are the odds that your fear will become reality? Like, for example, if somebody's a healthy person worried about dying from COVID, well, let's look at the data. Like, what are the odds that this fear will become a reality? What can what steps can we take to further lower these odds? Like if you're afraid about getting your parents uh, sick, well, boy, maybe you avoid interacting with them for some time, even though that's really hard to do, right? During the pandemic, I barely saw my parents. It was really difficult, but I was worried about them more than me. I mean, they're in their 70s, right? So my fear was getting them sick. So I'm like, I'm going to – my kids and I had very minimal contact with them because it was a precaution, right? So – these are different steps that we can take to lower uh, the impact that anxiety uh, has on us. Okay. So really peeling the onion and, and dissecting it out and finding re like applying reason and logic to the worry. Yeah. When it's more logic based, yeah. you know, when the anxiety is more physical, like, you know, you're having a hard time breathing and you're short of breath and you're pacing then we have to focus a little more on the physical coping skills to lower those physical symptoms because you can't outthink these physical symptoms. You really have to, if you're shallow in your breathing, deep breathing. If you're feeling hot and sweaty, cold water, cold air. If you're all tense, muscle relaxation, right? But sometimes the physical symptoms for people are minimal. It's a little more cognitive. And at that point, let's look at each worry individually because sometimes we stack our worries one on top of the other. And we're worrying endlessly and we don't even know what we're worrying about at the end. So it's like, okay, what does it mean to have anxiety about COVID? What does it mean to have anxiety about climate change? What does it mean to be worrying financially? And really getting to the root of that anxiety yeah. so you can really decipher it. Is there any way that we can take our perspective on anxiety and shift it a little so that we view it as an adaptive, the adaptive function that it was evolved to be, right? Like yeah, we're in a new situation, like we're nervous about giving a talk, right? And so our focus is really on just the talk, right? We've kind of blocked out the audience. We've, you know, our heart, we're a little sweaty, our heart rate's up, we're nervous, we're anxious about it. But at the same time, it's giving us focus. So how can we utilize it in some situations. Yeah. And again, we do not want to eliminate anxiety. Anxiety serves an adaptive purpose. We just want to tame the anxiety. We want to be able to have a grasp on the fire so it keeps us warm instead of being burned by the fire, right? So the goal isn't to eliminate it. The goal is to use it to our advantage. So the first step is how anxious I am. Am I a two out of 10 right now? Or am I like a 10 out of 10 about to have a panic attack? Where do I hold my anxiety, right? So having that level of self-awareness as far as the cognitive and the physical symptoms of anxiety allows us to be better masters of the anxiety. So once we recognize that it's just trying to protect us, then we can work with it. The biggest mistake that people make is that they don't want the anxiety. They resist the anxiety. I don't want to have anxiety. It's such a negative experience. So then they start to have anxiety about the anxiety, right? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? I see you smiling. Very like, meta, yeah. We, we start, right? And, and then we're off to the races. Like, I don't want anxiety, but I'm having anxiety. So then I get more anxious about the anxiety, right? Well, no, anxiety is just trying to protect you. It means well. It's just trying to be your friend, but sometimes it's excessive and doing it the wrong way. So you just have to work with this friend who needs a little bit of guidance is all it is. Fantastic. I think we definitely have a lot more to talk about. This is, I think, one of 
a few conversations that we're going to have about this topic, because it's definitely something that's clearly near and dear to my heart and important to me, my heart, which, you know, sometimes does race a little faster than I want it to. And there's so much for the physician population in, in general for you to help us. So thank you so much. This has been great. And if people want to find you online, where can they find you? Dr. Bradley Block, thank you for the opportunity to come on your podcast. This topic is near and dear to my heart as well. And again, anxiety is very common amongst physicians. So it's a topic that I think we should discuss more. As far as finding me at Dr. Demetrius on Instagram and Twitter, or I guess it's now it's called the X apparently. Oh, <laughs> and I also have a website uh, where I post you know articles from different outlets, DemetriusSatiris.com. So I'll spell my name out, D-I-M-I-T-R-I-O-S, last name T-S-A-T-I-R-I-S.com, where people can reach out and contact me. Well, I look forward to speaking to you again. Thank you so much for your time. Likewise. Thanks for listening. I have a favor to ask. You listened to the episode until the end, which means you either fell asleep or you really liked the episode. So please share it or like it or comment on a social media post or write us a five-star review, something. It would really help me out. And maybe what you learned from this episode can help someone else too. The views expressed in this episode are those of the interviewer and interviewee and don't represent the views of their employer or even their significant other. Even though the magic of podcasting make it sound like I'm talking directly to you, this is not a doctor-patient relationship and this is not medical advice or financial advice or really any advice. Thank us again for listening to The Physician's Guide to Doctoring.